We've just been talking about what goes on inside the core of a happy main sequence star like our sun or like any of the other ones. This is what's mainly happening, right? It's converting hydrogen to helium. But what happens when it stops doing this? So this is sort of, we're going to be talking about things now after the main sequence. That's really sort of, that's what we're doing here. We're looking at after the main sequence. Well, what happens then is the star runs out of hydrogen. So maybe we'll write this down. So we'll say here, uh, core it runs out of hydrogen. And so what happens then is, remember before we were talking about um, what's called hydrostatic equilibrium, this sort of constant battle between the outwards radiation pressure and the inwards gravity pressure. So there's sort of always this battle going on between sort of outwards and inwards pressures here. So it's sort of a constant fight. Now during the main sequence, it's going to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means everything's all stable. The outwards pressure equals the inwards one, so they're the same. But what happens when it runs out of hydrogen? If you think carefully about it, you should be able to work it out. So if it runs out of hydrogen, that means it doesn't have enough energy in order to sort of resist gravity. So if sort of you stop pushing outwards, gravity is going to just win. You know, it has its own mass, so it's going to attract itself, so everything sort of is going to come towards the center. So after the core runs out of hydrogen, the core collapses. Okay, that's really important. The core collapses, and so what's going to happen then, if I draw it maybe, uh, this right here would be the, uh, this would be the core right here, and that means it would collapse. What's neat though is this. So if the core collapses, what well, turns out what happens is the outer expands. This is a little bit strange. It's actually uh, something about shells here. So it's sort of, um, sort of a rule of shells. So what happens is if the core collapses, the outer part of the star actually expands. It's a bit backwards, but this is what's going to happen. Now, what happens next? Well, next, after this, what could happen is, well, if it collapses, maybe um, the pressure and the temperature, maybe they're high enough to start helium fusion. So helium to carbon, for example, or helium to oxygen fusion. So now what you end up with is another stable um, situation here. So here what we're going to have, we're going to have in the center then, we're going to have something that's you know fusing helium to, let's say, carbon or oxygen or something like that. But you will still have a shell over here that will still burn hydrogen to helium. And that's because although the core ran out, of um, hydrogen in order to fuse, the rest of it over here can still do it. So you have this, this sort of onion layer now, and each time, by the way, that this happens, the outer part of the star expands. Okay, so this happens each time. So what you've done now, the pressure and temperature were high enough to start helium to carbon fusion. So there we go. And that means then you're sort of in a happy, steady, stable state. And it turns out this process, for example, to get from helium to carbon, it's actually called the tri-alpha process. So it turns out you need uh, three of these helium fours, and those end up making a carbon-12, and so on. But I mean, lots of these processes go on inside stars. But if you see now, now we have this sort of second stable state here. But of course, I'm sure you can guess what happens next. Just like before, what about when it runs out of helium in the core? So that might happen. So when star, whoops, I can't seem to spell. So when the core runs out of helium, same sort of thing happens again. Core collapses, outer expands. Okay, so that's going to happen again. Um, and this time, of course, you're going to have um, 
of course, after the core collapses, like what happened here, when the core collapses, uh, the outer part expands. And then the temperature plus pressure might be high enough to fuse even higher. So the main idea behind this is that, of course, this then repeats. So then, of course, you're fusing the next thing. So maybe you're fusing carbon to something else. And then, of course, then it's going to run out of carbon and do new things. So each time it's going to get new layers, the outer part keeps expanding, the core keeps collapsing, getting hotter, denser. It makes the next thing. So this process basically repeats, repeats. So this keeps going, this process, this whole idea here. It keeps going and going. And um, now keep in mind, though, uh, that the end then, sort of the, the end result is this. You end up with what's called a red giant star. So maybe we'll write that down. So the process repeats from just before there. The process repeats until you have a red giant star. Now, it turns out not all stars will end up making such a big red giant. Okay, so not all of them will do this full state here, but a lot of them will. And what's going to happen is this. At the center of the red giant star, you're going to have iron and plus some other stuff. Over here, you're going to have other layers and other layers and other layers over here. But basically, the idea is this. It can't fuse iron anymore. Okay, so it turns out it can't fuse iron into anything else. You might wonder why is that? Well, it turns out if you look at the binding energy per nucleon, if we talk about nucleons here, those are the um, protons plus neutrons. This is a graph right here that's really important actually in atomic physics. I actually try to remember this graph. I actually call it the whale. And the reason I call it that is if you look at the way the graph goes like this right here, I just imagine for some reason, maybe a stupid reason, I imagine like a big whale that's sitting there like this. So this is sort of a, you know, this is like a happy whale here. This is like the top of the whale's head here. I don't know, that might sound really stupid, but if it helps you to remember these things, great. So anyway, I always call this graph the whale. So what happens is this. If you're going from, let's say, hydrogen to the next element, which would be helium, for example, you end up going up in this graph. And what that means is that this is energetically favorable in order to have fusion. In other words, going to the right on this graph. That happens until you get the element with the highest binding energy per nucleon, which, no surprise there, it's iron. So iron is element number 56. Uh, sorry, iron is element number 26, sorry. That's the number of protons. And we know then that it has, uh, let's see, 30 neutrons then, because 26 plus 30 gives you 56. And this is actually the element with the highest binding energy per nucleon. What that really means is, through fusion, it's not energetically favorable to do anything higher than this, because after that, it would sort of cost you too much energy in order to do this. And so what happens is, of course, what if you started over here? Let's say you had something like, I don't know, um, uranium. Uranium can have what we call fission. Fission is where you split an element. See, over here you were combining, you know, hydrogen plus hydrogen, dot, 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 ended up making helium. In other words, you're combining same element to make a heavier one. In fission, you're splitting elements. In other words, you start off with something high and you end up making smaller things. And fission is energetically feasible or favorable when you go sort of back this way. So then you might wonder again, like uh, just to reiterate, how is it then that you can make things higher than iron? And that's because, uh, well, it's not thought to be made, at least not easily, in the center of a star. There are a few situations when it can actually do it, but uh, they're not very common. They're called the R and S processes, and those are a little bit difficult to have. But if the star actually blows up, well, then you can have enough um, neutrons, it turns out, and enough energy, basically, to, and enough temperature and pressure in order to actually do start fusing iron to other things. This is so cool to think about, I think, because your own blood, for example, contains a lot of iron. 
And that means your own blood, the little pieces from your own blood, the iron in it, those were quite literally the centers of really high mass, or not, not high mass necessarily, but very evolved red giant stars. And that material ended up being spread out to the rest of the universe, you know, either when it blew up or when it just sort of spread it out through sort of puffing it out. What ended up happening is those iron little bits, those ended up sort of coalescing, maybe forming other stars. So it's like a, a big set of cosmic recycling. And you ended up with that iron in your blood. Now here is a better picture than what I could have drawn. This is the center of a high mass red giant star. Now when I say high mass, it just it turns out that not all stars will finish in this sort of complete state here of a red giant star. Some of them may not get all the way to iron. Maybe they only got to oxygen or something like that. So this is sort of the idea behind this. So we have an iron nickel core at the center and it can't it can't fuse anything higher, so it's sort of done. What happens then is we've got this uh, silicon here, um, which is fusing to iron. We've got over here oxygen fusing to silicon and so on and so on. And at the very outer shell, you have hydrogen still being fused to helium. So you have lots of different layers where fusion is happening, but the core keeps getting sort of successfully um, more and more advanced until you reach iron. So that is how we can deal with um, these red giant stars here. Now, we can see an example of a red giant star. That is this star Betelgeuse here. So that's this one, right? Or this is, if you remember your constellations, if you look at this star and this star and this one, and you have these, and you have these, those are really easy to find in the sky, I find. And this is supposed to make up a guy. It's supposed to make up a hunter named Orion. He's supposed to have a bow over here. It's supposed to be his body, and those are his legs. Here's the Orion Nebula, which is supposed to be his sword. Haha, <laughs> it's not a sword, it's something else. But either way, if we look at this one right here, though, let's look at this star, Betelgeuse, which is this one right here. That one right there is actually what's called a red super giant. Just because it's even bigger than a regular red giant. So we think the center of Betelgeuse is very much like this. In fact, we think that the layers in Betelgeuse are just like this. Now, Betelgeuse is actually found oops, uh, over here. If we drew a an HR diagram, so if we drew the luminosity versus the temperature, I drew this HR diagram again with this main sequence here. This would be the main sequence. Then Betelgeuse is somewhere way up here. That's where Betelgeuse is. So if a star, for example, had a lot of mass, then it might end up actually making uh, something as complicated or as sort of advanced, evolved-wise, as Betelgeuse. Now this one here is expected then to go supernova at some point. I mean, we, we could expect it to do that. And when I say we expect it, it could be soon. Now how soon? I don't know. It could be tens of years. It could be thousands of years. And what's really neat about this, when we say it's super giant, it really is huge. If you consider the solar system here, so let's say this here is the sun currently, and then we have, you know, going around it in orbit, we have Mercury. And then after that we have, whoops, I didn't spell it right, Mercury. After that we have Venus. I'm drawing really bad ellipses here. After that we have Earth. After that we have Mars. After that we have Jupiter. Well, it turns out if you were to replace our own sun with Betelgeuse, if you could just sort of switch them, and Betelgeuse would actually is so large, it would actually go out to somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. So all of this right here would all be part of Betelgeuse in here. It's that big. In other words, we'd be sitting in the star, so we'd be completely toast. We'd be part of one of these burning shells. Maybe we'd be in the carbon-oxygen burning shell. So there'd be fusion going on everywhere around us. We'd all be toast, so would the Earth. So it's pretty neat to think about that this giant, ridiculous star is only around 650 light years away only that's relatively close um, and if it goes supernova it should be really nice to look at it should be a beautiful thing to see in the sky i mean i think it'd be really nice to see but uh, maybe it went supernova 649 years ago but because it's 650 light years away we haven't seen the light from it explode yet
that we haven't seen the explosion because we're literally looking back in time when we look at this. So I like putting all this stuff together then and thinking about these stars and what actually happens to them. So either during the main sequence, like we learned about um, up here in the PP cycle, or what happens after the main sequence when it actually starts doing other things. So what ends up happening then with most stars is they will stay in the main sequence and what will happen to them, for example, like the Earth, it'll end up sort of doing this little path. It'll sort of go up and then have a little sort of twirly thing and go back up again and it'll end up probably making a red giant somewhere so somewhere either here or here this would be what our sun should end up doing now of course it's going to end up ballooning out and that's just because the outside parts balloon out each time it uh, does this sort of layer here each time the outer parts expand so that's how it ends up being so big but it doesn't become more massive right our own sun for example is only going to have less mass as it goes and that's because every second of its life, it's converting lots of its own mass to energy, as well as you know converting things to other elements. So our own sun, for example, is going to end up having less mass later than it had before. So it's not like these red giants end up having lots of mass. They're just the remnants of regular stars here. But they do get very large. They're very sort of ballooned or puffed out like this. Now I want to show you just uh, before we uh, end this one here, I just want to show you a quick little cartoon. This is done by XKCD. And I like this one. This is like an announcer and he's saying, All of Hollywood is in town for tonight's star-studded premiere. We go live to our reporter on the red carpet. How do things look? And she says, Bleak. In 800 million years, the aging, brightening sun will boil away the oceans and all this will be blowing sand. Why is that? That's because our own sun is going to end up becoming a red giant. So that's why, I mean, it's going to boil away the oceans. The guy says, oh, um, sounds pretty grim. How are the stars reacting? Of course, he meant the stars as in the uh, you know, famous people. But of course, she says, how are the stars reacting? Hydrogen fusion. But it won't last forever. I meant the movie stars. She says, they won't last forever either. None of us will. <laughs>